We're gonna give, oh, we, we are recording this meeting. We're gonna give it a minute or two for folks to join and we'll get started very soon here. Thanks for joining us. And officially say good afternoon. <laughs> And happy spring. <laughs> uh, yes. That's 16 participants right now. A couple more joining. Jen, did you want to put the PowerPoint up? Oh, sure. Sorry, I was going to wait till there we go. Okay. Bear with me one second. Can you see that okay, Rebecca? It's it's up. Great. Thank it's you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's about 12.01. I want to be um, respectful of everyone's time and go ahead and begin. Uh, we could have others joining, of course, and uh, we welcome everyone to this meeting, the Kings Beach Parking Community Meeting. Um, my name is Rebecca Tabor, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Public Works here in Tahoe. And with me, I'm joined by Julie Dixon, who's with, she is our uh, Principal Consultant with our Parking Consultant, uh, Dixon Resources Unlimited. This meeting is a follow-up meeting to the series of community meetings that we conducted in January and February of this year, which offered some background and parking management concepts. And then also we asked the community to share feedback on parking challenges in the Kings Beach and Tahoe Vista areas. Next slide, please. The county has a resort triangle transportation plan. We call it the RTTP. And this is the Placer County approved plan we are working to implement. It consists of elements that work together to help reduce traffic congestion and to promote and enhance public transit use. A major goal of the RTTP is to get people out of their cars and for visitors to essentially park once and, and stay at their lodging, but then enjoy the area by using our free transit services, bike and walk as much as possible. This aligns with community, community vitality and economic health priorities, as well as transportation and environmental sustainability priorities of the Tahoe region. I want to acknowledge today the support of the North Tahoe Business Association and their subcommittee members, the Economic Vitality Committee, or EVC, that are working closely with Placer County staff on development of this draft parking management implementation plan. I also want to thank and acknowledge the funding and support of this program by the North Tahoe Community Alliance. As you can see on this badge on the top right, your local TOT and TBID dollars are at work to improve parking conditions in Kings Beach. Next slide, please. So our, our meeting today is organized into a start with the project overview and progress. Uh, we will share a list of draft parking management recommendations. And then we will wrap up the presentation and really just open it up to an open question answer session and discussion. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Julie Dixon and she'll start going through the recommendations and take it from here. Great, thank, thank you so much, Rebecca. No problem. Thank you everyone again for taking time out of your day. As Rebecca mentioned uh, on Monday night, we actually had this uh, same presentation uh, on site and had a really great um, attendance. And so now uh, what we'd like to do is provide the same information to you. And if you'll just take note of any questions or comments or feedback, uh, this is absolutely the opportunity to share that information. 
And uh, just a little bit about Dixon uh, for anybody who hasn't attended our previous meetings. We are a uh, parking and transportation a firm that really focuses on challenges like those in Kings Beach. Have actually worked around the basin uh, from Truckee to South Lake, uh, projects with TTD also in Reno as well, and also other mountain resort towns uh, like Park City, Utah, Whitefish, Montana. So definitely have a bit of an understanding of the impacts to your community. And just wanted to make sure one of the things that I like to share when we talk about projects like these is that while there may be cookie cutter challenges, um, there are no cookie cutter solutions. And so we really appreciate the feedback that we've been receiving to date. And I hope that you'll find that when we talk about this approach in terms of this process, that we've been able to holistically incorporate your feedback um, and we'll look forward to more of that today. So as Rebecca mentioned uh, earlier this year, at the beginning of the year was our first round of outreach. And that's where we really started developing that implementation plan guideline um, in terms of how to manage parking moving forward. And now here we are with all of you again to present that draft of those recommendations so that we can get your additional feedback from there. In the meantime, we're also working on some financial projections based on the costs associated with the recommendations that have been outlined including the potential if in the future paid parking is considered, what that would also mean from a financial ramification expense and um, revenue projection perspective. We are looking forward to being able to go to the County Board of Supervisors late summer, early fall. But as you heard Rebecca mention, we're hoping to actually um, implement a couple of opportunities for doing some demonstration pilots this summer especially so that we can start to see if some of these recommendations can actually have an impact on congestion and really on parking supply. And so based on the review and or approval of the Board of Supervisors in regards to the action plan, that is then when the formal implementation process would begin. And our hopes is to really leverage data that we can collect this summer to really have that influence and effect to demonstrate what these recommendations could mean to the Kings Beach area. So what you see in front of you is the actual defined study area. And one of the things you might notice are the little red box, or sorry, colorblind, the little blue boxes at the top of your screen. What we are trying to do is capture all of the ingress and egress points where potentially visitors could be entering the Kings Beach area. This is particularly important as we talk about wayfinding and signage of ways that we could discourage visitors from entering the residential neighborhoods. We know there's already obviously some speed impediment devices like speed bumps and such, but we wanted to leverage the signage campaign uh, while being mindful of sign blight and quality of life issues but that way we could try to mitigate um, traffic and impacts into the neighborhoods, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment. So when we do talk about the different recommendation categories, we basically divided it into three items. There's general parking management strategies and we'll go through each of these bullets. We'll also talk about the potential of paid parking and what that could look like. And we'll also talk about the residential parking permit recommendations that also go along with these opportunities. I do think it's important to make sure to recognize and reinforce for everybody, and again, I know that you all live this, is that this is going to be a comprehensive change that's going to be required. There's not just one magic bullet that is going to be able to solve for this um, impact. And so what you'll see here today is that it's a collective of recommendations that we know are gonna to have to be done to be able to try to make that positive influence so that we can talk about making sure that you all can access what we'll call your commercial district so that you can grab your pizza or grab your dinner or get to the store or make a pit stop at any of those commercial locations while making sure that our the folks that are visiting us to utilize our recreational areas are not impeding upon our commercial district nor are they impeding upon any of our property owners, including residential and also our various businesses. But we'll dig into these individually so that that way you all will have a good understanding of the approach. So while not a lot of people like to talk about parking enforcement, the one thing we did hear loud and clear from the community feedback was that we need consistent parking enforcement. And many of you may already be aware of the fact there have already been resources allocated 
and you've hopefully already started to see the impact of having additional coverage provided by our code compliance officers. And along with that compliance, we also already have an implemented uh, penalty schedule that's on an accelerated penalty schedule that was already approved and implemented by the county. That's something that we're excited about because it's something like, for those of you that remember when California implemented the seatbelt law regulation, you might recall that you know the first notification was a warning, second was a citation at $25, the next citation was $50, and so on and so forth. And that's very much how the penalty schedule has been defined in Kings Beach, and we're excited about that potential to really, again, try to demonstrate how we want to change behavior uh, when it comes to how people are making their parking choices. So along with that comes some technology improvements, uh, one of which includes today we are relying on a paper ticket book, which is very traditional in regards to parking enforcement management services. But the reality of how most agencies manage their parking programs is using what we call an automated handheld device you still get a paper notice on your windshield. However, we're able to actually now more efficiently and effectively manage that flow or workflow associated with that notice that was issued, including providing immediate access for customers to be able to not only appeal their citations online, but to also pay their citations online. So we know that this will have um, an, imp an Im immediate impact on your operation, and something that will also help allow the county to be more administratively efficient as we talk about managing the program moving forward. And more importantly is, based on that escalating schedule on penalties, the parking enforcement personnel are going to be able to notice via the handheld, this car has never received a warning, this car actually is on its second violation, so the technology will automatically issue the penalty as appropriate of where they are on the violation scale. Additionally, we're looking forward to the utilization of mobile license plate recognition technology. The picture that's uh, there on the screen, you'll notice these little black boxes that are on top of the vehicle. Those are license plate recognition um, cameras. And we're looking forward to the utilization of LPR technology throughout Kings Beach because not only will we be able to more efficiently monitor the time limits as posted, we'll also be able to leverage uh, data collection so that we can demonstrate by time of day, day of the week, time of the year, what the actual occupancy numbers are by block base, by parking lot, et cetera. And that is particularly important because those might recall that saw us speak earlier this year is that we wanna make sure that the county is making data-driven decisions and when you're at 85% occupancy, that basically means you need to make parking management changes. We're hopeful that we're going to be able to leverage LPR technology um, sometime this summer so that as we go to the Board of Supervisors with recommendations, we'll actually be able to demonstrate to them the actual occupancy numbers rather than opinions or perspectives. We'll have the actual counts throughout the Kings Beach area. And this is something that I also like to reinforce Sometimes people hear us talk about LPR technology and they get a little bit nervous. I wanna make sure that everybody understands there is no license plate lookup capabilities associated with the LPR technology that the county will be using. All that happens is, is that as the vehicle drives by, it checks the license plate because basically the license plate is your validator for whether or not you're eligible, eligible to park there or if your parking session is um, expired. So basically the LPR cameras say, this car can park here or this car can't park here so that the parking enforcement personnel know that they have to take some additional steps. One of the things about this exercise that we've been going through over the last several months has been extensive engagement with our stakeholders, including our key stakeholders with representatives from not only the Sheriff's Department, but also from CHP. And we know that upon implementation of any of these efforts, we just met with them actually yesterday again, we need to be sure that we have a really good game plan of who's doing what, where, why, and how. Uh, we know our sworn officers and deputies and CHP officers are obviously um, stretched fairly thin. 
And so the opportunity of us to be able to have dedicated parking enforcement resources um, throughout Kings Beach is something we're excited about. And the reality of us being able to understand who's going to play what role and making sure that it's very easy for you as community members to know what phone number to call for what the purpose is. So we really want to make it simple. We're also looking forward to continuing on with a proactive vehicle abatement program. That was something we heard a lot of feedback on from you all as community members. And one of the things that we're proposing is a post and pre winter vehicle abatement sweep to make sure that we can get those cars that have been left behind or have become derelict and getting them off the streets. And then also with the LPR technology, we're gonna be able to help proactively manage and monitor the 72 hour California vehicle code, code rules. So my hope is, is that through these recommendations, we'll be able to be more proactive in making sure that we don't just have these vehicles stored for the long term, um, whether it be on street or on any of the county lots. And this brings me to staffing and coverage. You heard me use the word consistent coverage, and that's really the key. As we're building the staffing model and doing those financial projections, it's one of the things that we want to make sure that we have coverage throughout the entire week so that that way people understand how the rules are enforced and when they're enforced so that people will follow the rules. And I think if anything that you take away from this meeting, we want everyone to know what we're doing. There will be a very proactive education and outreach campaign because we want people to follow the rules. And I think that that's really the key is there's no covert parking operations here. We want everybody to follow along and to understand what we're trying to do because it really is about community access, equitability, and making sure that it's easy for people to find a parking space so that they can enjoy our businesses and restaurants and for those that want to utilize um, the recreational areas, we want them to park in our long-term locations, which takes me into supply and demand management. There are only so many parking spaces, and I know you all realize that. And what we want to make sure that we're doing definitively is we want to make sure that people understand the commercial area is to support our commercial businesses, and what we want to do is really identify where those long-term parking spaces are so that they can store their vehicles in those locations if they want to use our recreational amenities. And this is why the Park Once philosophy is so important. You might notice on the right side of the screen, the no reparking in this zone sign is something that has worked very effectively in other communities so that for you parking in front of that two-hour time limit in front of a restaurant or shop, we want to make sure that you actually come in, enjoy the amenities, and then move your car so that another customer can come in and utilize our commercial zone. We do not want people utilizing our commercial zone for recreational purposes to go to the beach and stay there all day. It's one of the reasons why the escalating fee schedule is going to be so advantageous for us. So we really want to reinforce if you're coming for the recreational purposes, park once, park in one of our long-term destination locations and enjoy the area. But if you're coming to enjoy our commercial area, again, utilize the time limits as posted. The other piece of this education and outreach campaign and something that you might have heard Rebecca mention is we really want to leverage transit. The fact that we have a free transit option um, for Kings Beach is amazing. And I will reinforce the fact that we're trying to absolutely improve our routing. It comes down to bus driver availability and the shortage that we have for bus drivers. But the reality of us having free transit is something that we want everyone to take advantage of. Having just been in Kings Beach and seeing all the TART Connect vehicles and finding out that that service was available to you all, I was quite envious, I must say. But this is going to be really important when we again talk about the commercial versus the recreational. And there's a couple of things that we completed yesterday when we did an on-site uh, walkabout the community was identifying locations where we can ensure that there are some short-term parking options in the commercial area so that for those of you that want to pop into the store, pick up a burrito or pick up a package, we want to make sure that you have that type of availability so that it again is conducive for providing that customer access to our shops and businesses. And that's also important when we talk about active pickup and drop-off zones near the beach. 
because of the fact that we know we have limited parking spaces for the recreational use, we want to identify locations that make it easy for our visitors to be able to drop off their family and their gear as close to the beach as possible, and then they can go take their car and park it in one of the more long-term locations, which I'll talk about in a moment. That's something that we also know can have a real benefit when we talk about the backup on the highway and the reality of cars double parking and triple parking to be able to get their stuff out of the car because it's as close to the water as they can get. So we want to be mindful of that. I also just wanted to touch on Assembly Bill 413. For those of you who aren't aware of that Assembly Bill, it went into action um, April, sorry, January 1 of this year, and it basically goes into enforcement January 1 of 2025. And basically, Assembly Bill 413 is what's called the daylighting ordinance. And daylighting basically means that you won't be able to park within 20 feet of an intersection. It's important when we talk about pedestrian view lines and bicycle view lines is that that is basically what has been approved by the state of California in order to improve um, intersection safety. So that is something, too, that a lot of agencies are currently assessing and evaluating what that means, how it can be done. But I just wanted everyone to know and have that on their radar to be aware of that. I also wanted to mention public-private agreements. We've mentioned this in our previous meetings. Uh, right now, we are pursuing um, for sure one uh, potential demonstration location. Hopefully for this summer, there's um, some additional legal steps that we have to take with conversations with Safeway and the property owner. But it is our hope that we might be able to have a pilot in place for this summer where approximately one third of the Safeway lot could be turned into long-term paid parking with no overnight vehicle storage. And the remainder of the Safeway lot would become a two hour time limit zone. And it's something that when we talk about a public private shared parking agreement, basically the rules become enforceable by the county. And those are some of the terms and conditions that have to be finalized, but the opportunity to be able to identify that location and provide additional um, potential paid parking revenue, but more importantly, more available parking resource is something that we'll hope we'll be able to balance some of the utilization and needs. And we also have identified a couple of additional locations, some of the bank locations that we're initiating some of the conversations and hopes that we could leverage some of those available parking assets. So definitely stand by for those. And you all heard me mention data and data collection. Uh, the hope is for this summer that we'll not only be able to leverage license plate recognition technology, but also continue to capture ongoing traffic flow data counts for car volumes in Kings Beach. So that as we take recommendations forward to the Board of Supervisors, we can demonstrate and show the actual utilization numbers and what the true impacts are throughout the region. So you've heard me mention this a little bit, but wayfinding and signage, what we're really trying to do for this particular summer, especially leading up to our presentation to the Board of Supervisors, is being able to look at some of the, what I'll call low hanging fruit opportunities. We have several county parking lots that are basically behind our commercial businesses all along uh, the strip. And our hope is, is that we could actually leverage a comprehensive signage plan that could help breadcrumb our visitors to those locations so that they will alleviate us for the commercial time zones to make sure that our customers still have that access. Our hope is, is that in working with Caltrans, that we'll be able to have a initiated comprehensive plan um, initiated with typically, you know, those P's that help define and identify to you when you come into a community by leveraging some of the breadcrumbing with some of those P wayfinding signs so that people will know that we have parking available within walking distance. Right now, um, historically, the feedback we've heard from the community is that many of those lots are currently underutilized. People don't even know they're there. And so if we can help offset that opportunity and be able to have cars parked there, it's something that we're excited to pursue that, pursue that opportunity because that could be a low cost impact and that could provide improvement again to some of the congestion impacts that we have. We also wanna make sure that it's easy to understand 
where you are allowed to park. And many of you are probably familiar with the pervious parking pads uh, that have been installed previously. We want to make sure that everyone understands where you are or are not allowed to park. And so that's one of the things we've been talking about potentially with the use of paint or potentially with signage. We just don't want to overwhelm the community with signage. But our hope is that we'll be able to communicate that messaging so that everybody understands where they are allowed to park and the fact that you're not allowed to park on the dirt and how we can communicate that. I mentioned this at the onset, but we really want to make sure that we can differentiate the difference between the commercial areas and the residential areas. Spillover parking is real, meaning that when you run out of parking availability, people tend to fill up the neighboring streets. And that's one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we're clearly communicating the differential between the commercial district and our residential district so that people understand where they are supposed to park versus where they may park. And that's gonna be important as we talk about the residential parking permit program here in a moment. But let me first touch on paid parking. So paid parking is definitely on the pipeline, but it hasn't been approved. I wanna highlight that. The opportunity for us to demonstrate this summer with the potential of the Safeway parking lot portion that I mentioned, and maybe one other location. This is something that we're hoping to experiment what that opportunity could look like for the county, as well as how the technology could work um, in the community. And there's also several other things that we'll have to navigate as we talk about, you know, the state arterial, if we can manage parking on those locations, including paid parking solutions. But these are all things that we ultimately talk about accessibility and having parking spaces available, it really comes down to compliance and customer service. We want people to follow the rules. We have to make sure we have the appropriate resources to support those rules. But ultimately, this is what's going to lead to what those next steps can be. There are several steps that have to go into the ultimate solution, which includes some updates to the county code. Uh, we want to make sure that if a paid parking plan is approved, that we establish what's called a parking benefits district so that the revenues generated basically are reinvested in Kings Beach. We know that we need to have a defined employee parking plan so that where the employees are supposed to park for the long term, as well as introducing opportunities for potential merchant validation opportunities, a local benefits program that could provide incentives or motivation for residents to be able to park and utilize perks associated with the program, as well as overall implementing a citizen's advisory group, because this will not be the last time that we talk about parking. And ultimately, when we talk about some of the technology I mentioned earlier, not only are we hoping to be able to test a couple of locations this summer, but everything that we want to do, obviously, is license plate based. And if paid parking is implemented, we want to leverage not only mobile payment, but text to pay. And that ultimately leads to where some of you may have seen the Park Tahoe brand. This is something that we're excited about that could provide a uniform messaging opportunity for the entire basin as it relates to parking and transportation information. I think you all can appreciate the fact that it's very siloed around the lake and our opportunity to be able to connect all of the major hubs Leveraging the Park Tahoe brand is something that we're excited about the potential. We're really motivated at the fact that we're going to have the personnel on the streets for this summer. And you see that image there on the right side of the screen, the ask me motivation there. What's really neat is it's another pair of eyes and ears out there on the street to help provide information, access, and just, you know, directions. And that also just really comes down to that overall customer service approach in and around Kings Beach. So I've mentioned residential parking a few times, and what I like to always highlight is we anticipate the potential for spillover, and the code will be prepared and readied for if at what time residents are in need or in want of a residential parking permit program. Oftentimes we're asked, well, why aren't we just implementing a permit program immediately I want to highlight the fact that when we implement a residential parking permit program, it does impact the residents and basically how they have to manage their own parking experiences. 
So um, consistently throughout California, what ends up happening is you as a group of residents petition the county for a permit program to demonstrate your want for that program. And then there's a traffic study that's done to validate the need for that program. And then ultimately, if a permit program is implemented, the technology that supports it, but there's also a self-management requirement that comes along with that, but it does impact your access to the curb. And so it's not necessarily a given. And it's something that if the community desires that, that's something that's definitely on the ready for when that community is interested in that potential opportunity. So what you really see is what we shared here today is really these incremental steps and being prepared for those next steps. And I understand, you know, what the impacts have been in the past years, but sometimes in some communities, it can be the easy, low-hanging fruit, simple fixes that can really make a difference. Maybe in the eventuality, you'll get to those next steps, but it might not necessarily come as fast as maybe it was anticipated based on how the program, how the community, and how the public are responding to those changes. So with that, I know that was a lot of information. And so we're looking forward to hearing feedback, comments, questions about any of the information that we've shared. But what I'd also like to make sure, and I know my colleague Jennifer will put this in the chat, is that you all have our project email address, pc at dixonresourcesunlimited.com. Uh, you're welcome to continue to send communications via that email. Um, but just in regards to our next steps, the anticipation is taking the feedback that we've received uh, during our site visit throughout this week, as well as during this meeting, make some updates to the plan, and then do some testing and piloting uh, throughout this summer so that ultimately when we get to the County Board of Supervisors late summer, early fall, we can have a really comprehensive approach. Um, but I just wanted to highlight on some of these uh, opportunities like the wayfinding and the signage. We're not waiting until we get to that ultimate approval. We want to demonstrate some of the opportunities of what kind of an impact it can have by proceeding um, for these actions this summer. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share. And let me just get my screen set up here so that I can see everyone. And I was just going to ask that if anybody wanted to raise their hand, um, we can uh, unmute you and let you share your feedback or your comments. Um, you're also welcome to put um, anything in the chat um, if there's a statement or a question that you want to ask in there. But um, I'll pause there and see if anybody wants to raise their hand. And you can go to the bottom of your toolbar where you see reactions. And there is a raise hand function on there if um, there's anyone that wants to participate. We've got a lot of attendees. I'm sure that someone's got some feedback. Sarah, I see you've took your camera off. If you nod your head and tell me that you wanted to ask a question, stand by one moment. Let me uh, find your name here on the list. Bear with me one moment here. I'm going to ask if you can unmute yourself, Sarah. Good afternoon, this is Sarah Van Sicklin, Executive Director at the Truckee North Tahoe Transportation Management Association. Just wanted to provide my support and commend you all for working on this. It's great to see all of the different things that you're thinking about. I love seeing um, the enforcement, some of that technology being used, the innovative way that you're working with Safeway and looking at this um, problem and solutions from all angles. So thank you for your work on this and just wanted to um, share our support. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for coming today. And then I see JS, if you want to nod your head or give me a thumbs up, did you want to unmute? Yep, stand by. Bear with me. If you could go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, you guys. I talked with you yesterday. Rebecca, Julie, nice to see you. Okay, good. Or Jennifer, sorry. Um, I'm loving the, the program. I, I'm so glad that I'm staying involved with these meetings because I'm learning so much more each time. I, I have a vision of what I think the meeting is, and then it turns into something else. So I am so appreciative of you guys. Um, my, my concern about your parking at Safeway is um, 
being a, a lifer here and a local here, we, Rebecca and I briefed on it yesterday about you've got to time everything, you know? So for me to like go to Truckee, go to my eye doctor, everything is just such a time and it's getting exhausting. It's getting exhausting to live in my own town. But back to my eyes, I've got really bad eyesight and it takes me longer than two hours to go through my shopping to Safeway. Got so it. for me to find a parking space and then be rushed and to con control wh when I'm going to go shopping, you know, between my work schedules, it it's getting tough to live up here. No, that's really good feedback. I will share with you. It was actually the Safeway that shared two hours is about their targeted number. But I will also share with you that we had the conversation with them if extended time was needed uh, for shoppers, some opportunities that we could tie in. And without getting too ambitious here, um, when we talked about the locals program specifically, we actually think there could be an opportunity to leverage your Safeway, um, like your rewards card type of thing. And again, I might be overly ambitious, but there might be a way that you'll be able to leverage that as well so that that way there's not an issue of that. But I also will share with you the conversation that we had with, with Safeway was to ensure that this was not a punitive solution for customers. Okay. And I think that that's really important so that I'll just share this in advance is that if you received a parking citation and you were a customer of Safeway, that would be something that I, I would apologize in advance for the inconvenience, but on the back of that citation notice are the instructions of how to appeal that parking citation. And I would encourage you to not only respond in that timely requirement, but to include a copy of your receipt or your customer transaction when you were in the store. So I'm sure you can appreciate the what's happening today is the person that parks in the parking lot, goes in and buys a soda pop, and then goes to the beach for eight hours is really the challenge that we're trying to um, uh, to avoid. And so um, this is also a starting point so that as we get through this summer, that's going to be where really identifying what that proper time slot is. And that was one of the key aspects of the conversation that we had with uh, the grocery store about how to make sure that that customer experience was not a negative one. And because we obviously are so appreciative because we don't really have a lot of options with parking assets, so we know that this was kind of a dip your toe in the water opportunity here for sure. Thank you so much. I, you guys have answered my questions. It, it, that's exactly what it is. It's just not to have negative life experiences while I'm trying to continue up here. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, will, <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will add this to you only because having done similar things like this as well, there will clearly be a way to also message once the project is launched and in its full fledged you know, mode so that you can provide ongoing feedback because just like any project, and I think you all have heard me say this before, this will not be perfect um, because that's the reality. We're dealing with people and cars and you know so many factors that everyone's feedback throughout this process is gonna be so important because we wanna have an adaptive solution. And that's really, again, about finding that right size fit for Kings Beach. And this is where you got to kind of start somewhere and it's trying to figure out, you know, what's that best starting point. So your feedback is absolutely well received and know that this is actually an active part of that conversation uh, with the grocery store. So thank you for coming today. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. And nice to talk to all, right. all of you. <laughs> Thanks again. So I see we have a hand up. Let me get you, Gabe. Bear with me one minute here. So Gabe, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, um, I had a, a quick question on the zones. Um, so I'm just trying to understand if I'm in the commercial zone and I go and I have lunch and it takes an hour and 45 minutes and I decide to move, but I'm still in a commercial zone. I can't, right? So I move because I'm going to go to CVS or something. Uh, so I have another half an hour of stuff to go do. I'll be over the two hours. So you have to completely leave the zone, is that correct? So this is what I would suggest. It's a good question. Right now we haven't defined the zones specifically yet, nor has the reparking ordinance been approved. So I wanna reinforce that piece. What we're highlighting is that um, a no reparking ordinance would be advantageous 
to ensure that we're managing commercial access. But what some communities have done is they've basically tried to create parking zones that are like maybe about two blocks, you know, in width, give or take, because it's really about people trying to game the system or roll their car one space forward. I used the example in a previous meeting of back in the olden days when um, entities used chalk to mark tires, people used to go out and rub the chalk off of their tire and think they were good to go. But the reality of what a lot of folks will do is they'll just go and they'll actually do a little bit of parking roulette, as I like to call it, where they just roll one space or two. So this is where the intention of that is. But what I also like to reinforce with the park once mentality too is, ideally we can have a walkable, accessible community so that you can navigate you know, the commercial area by just parking in that one location. But I also like to reinforce that for that longer term stay, is to be able to use you know the county parking lots which right now anticipated to be free and that's what you know the motion of us moving forward right now for this summer is so i think that that's going to be something that when you talk about it but also if i was going to cvs and i could ideally park in their parking lot but knowing the distance between the zones is going to be something that would be defined but i would typically say that that radius is about two blocks and my hope is the industry standard is that customers are typically willing and able to walk about two to three blocks. So the hope is, is that if we can create our zones with about that big of a difference, you're able to multi-stop shops and be able to utilize that just as the time limits are posted today. Okay, perfect. I, I would just say one, um, so that helps me a lot, two two blocks. That means if I am hey, going to go to the lumber yard, which is like four blocks, I could find a new parking spot and be okay. Yes. Um, and then I, you know, I'm just a little concerned. I mean, we see the two hour parking. It's probably something you guys have totally studied. You see them everywhere. Um, I do know like sometimes restaurants are like, it's an hour wait, <laughs> you know, and you sit down yeah. and it's like a half hour just to get served. I mean, you're there for three hours easily. Um, I don't know if, if we're thinking about maybe having some areas be longer for that reason. If it, you know, I, I'm just throwing it out there. No, so you raise a really great point, Gabe. And so when we talk about kind of now versus the future, one of the first things that you are so on point with your question, because what I'd like to reinforce is this summer should be about in managing as posted. Let's work with the rules as stated with our time limits. You know, we've got some short term spaces. We've got some two hour spaces. Right now you can park all day in the county parking lots. So our recommendation is this summer, let's work with what we have and let's basically demonstrate with consistent coverage what that could mean in terms of access. Because even using your example of, you know, hopping five blocks down the street to get to the lumber yard, if we do this effectively, there should be a parking space waiting for you down there five blocks so that you can hopscotch and do your stuff throughout the community. So the recommendation right now is utilizing the rules as posted, using the parking lots for that longer term experience because, and again, anticipating the popularity, people love Kings Beach, we know that, based on the data, then comes the recommendations of what those next steps are to determine should the time limits be longer. And looking at the fact of, you know, when the LPR goes through, we're going to be able to determine how long the cars are staying for, what the average stay is, occupancy utilization turnover. These data points are going to speak to what those time limits potentially should be or when or if paid parking is implemented. Should I be able to add an additional hour with the understanding that the more time I'm able to add, the more likely you will have recreators, beachgoers, parking your commercial core. So it's going to be a real fine balance of that. But I think everything that you've described is where this summer can be our what I'll call discovery mode by leveraging the policies as posted to determine what really should happen in the future as it relates to Kings Beach. So your ideas and questions are so on point that I think what we're doing here for Kings Beach is really building that baseline so that we really know the directions that we should go in. And in fact, I think I just saw a question in there about weekends versus weekdays. 
And right now, I think it's important to reinforce is again, as posted, we want to make sure that we're managing the rules as posted and then recommendations in the future could lead to different rules by time of year, day of the week, and factors like that. And what we're thinking as well for this particular summer is to replicate as the state park does with the rules. I think it was May 1 through September 30, if I'm remembering the dates correctly, but to really, again, be consistent with how the state is managing. And then again, based on the data that I see, Kathleen has posted that question. That's really how we'll be able to leverage this opportunity this summer of what we can do next. And I know that this doesn't necessarily meet everybody's need for the immediate, but when we also talk about a sustainable, long-term, successful program, it's really about building a program that's going to serve Kings Beach and the community in which you live. And I think that's one of the reasons why we really want to get this right. And I mean, heard from so many residents about the impacts that, you know, many of you have lived there for several decades. And so we really are trying to do this systematically so that we can make sure that we're building a solution that's really going to fit and really going to work as well. So, and Gabe, I didn't want to cut you off. I wanted to make sure. Did you have any other questions? Good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. So I wanted to check in. I see a couple other cameras that have come off. I just want to look at, I see a question Due to the use of TVRA Lakeside Beach boat ramp, please extend the area um, to National Avenue. Um, and then we did, we actually went over there and looked at these locations uh, that is overused by beachgoers. We actually drove that route yesterday and went and actually extended those locations as well. I want to also be realistic that in terms of the approach this summer, what you see highlighted there is our starting point but it doesn't mean that you will be ignored. I want to reinforce that. We're going to definitely take advantage with the equipment that we have to be able to collect data. And we definitely understand the impacts of our beachgoers and how that expends and extends over. And it's another reason why we're so happy to report that Caltrans has been at the table with us talking about the things that we also need to do, given that it's a state arterial. There's another question that was posted uh, let me see, do, um, I'm going to say, does a bus, um, let me see that beach, let me let's try to interpret this one. Oh, sorry, I'm going to get bust in. So I think this is about busing people to the beach, a certain lot, get bust in. I'm, I, Rebecca, can you help me read that question and see how you're reading it? I think it says, do, do we do a bus that beach goers go park at a certain lot and get bust in? Got it. Park and ride. Okay. Thank Park you. Right. Very much. We did that. So um, absolutely. This is one of the things where we're definitely looking to definitely leverage the bus program. We're also looking forward to the opportunity of identifying the ski resort locations where they could park and ride. This is also one of the reasons why we want to leverage the wayfinding signs as much as we possibly can in this campaign so that people can plan ahead. And the more information that we can get out in advance, again, to have folks uh, not bringing their cars uh, would be ideal as much as that can have an effect. And Tom, I see that you've uh, taken your camera off. Are you looking to, yep, let me uh, find you here on my list. Bear with me one second here. Tom, can you go ahead and unmute yourself? Thank you. Uh, appreciate the presentation today. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit more on the data collection and how that uh, uh, transitions ultimately into a private uh, permit parking uh, process. Great. When you say private, are you meaning for the residential parking oh, permit programs? Residential. And, uh, you know, what does that look like? I'm, of course, uh, interested in our immediate area. We are between North Lake Tahoe Boulevard and the water uh, at the beach. And there's, um, you know, for half a century, there's been lots of pressure on every available square inch of dirt, uh, rock, whatever it is to, to park down there. So I'm wondering about data collection and ultimately how that might uh, uh, transition into uh, some type of residential parking program and the timing on that. No, great question. So I'll, I'll caveat one thing, which is when we talk about data, so the number 85, you might've heard me say this in previous meetings as well, why 85% is relevant is because when you're at 85% occupancy, it basically means you're nearer at um, capacity 
and when you need to make parking management decisions. So that's your first like you know measure of when we talk about why we monitor the data. So when we specifically talk about residential parking permit programs, it's one of the things that we want to make sure that the county code is updated so consistent with other agencies when a residential neighborhood is impacted by what I will call a commercial area or an attraction, maybe like a lake. Um, and the reality, or like a university is a good example too, where it's a popular draw and you tend to have a spillover effect onto those neighboring streets. What happens in a tra traditional request program is that the neighborhood gets together and actually gathers a petition to demonstrate that we want to do something different about parking in our residential neighborhood. It doesn't mean that you can prohibit others from parking there, but what it can do is if it's approved, it basically provides you permission to park beyond posted regulations in some cases, with the exception of things like snow removal, street sweeping, or other regulatory requirements. So based on the petitioning process and how the code is established, it's important to recognize the compliance of that because in some cases, you have to have contiguous blocks to participate in said program so that it's a basically a certain distance of area. And then if you can get a certain percentage, again, depending on the community, oftentimes it's 75% of your neighbors, property owners, and or renters who sign this petition. That's then when it goes to the county, if this is the process that's approved, to review and then in a typical application process, then what happens is the county goes out and does a traffic study. And to your benefit, as a result of this effort, data is gonna be collected consistently as a result of the technology that we're suggesting. In some cases, some agencies require some specific study at certain times of the day, et cetera. And then ultimately, if everybody gives the thumbs up on the process, there could be certain fees involved at the application process. Again, these are all different by different agencies. If a permit program is approved, there's also some additional steps that I wanna reinforce. Most agencies have it that once the permit program is authorized or approved by the Board of Supervisors, then you have a participation requirement. So just because you got it approved, then you have to have a certain participation of those residents that actually purchase the parking permits to make that a viable, eligible parking permit zone for residential passes. Oftentimes you'll see time limits permit exempt. That would be something that would be pretty standard for an area that's adjacent to an attraction like yours. But that is what I would anticipate that'll be some form or some shape of a program like that. But again, this also goes down to if there's any legacy policies associated with residential parking permits, you know, around the basin or anything like that, that I don't want to, you know, promise anything here that, you know, I'm not authorized to do. But I do think that the opportunity to build in the business rules for that is one of the things that we're anticipating because of the fact that you do have those spillover effects. Um, but it also permit eligibility is also a big part of that process too is that when or if a residential parking permit program is authorized, who is eligible to utilize those parking permits, who can acquire those parking permits, and what are the rules associated with utilizing those parking permits. So there definitely is a lot to it, and I hope that that gave you a bit of a detailed overview of what it could potentially look like, but everything that we also are obviously talking about here today would ultimately be subject to the Board of Supervisors approval but that is one of the items that we are including in the recommendations that we need to have the code readied for a residential parking permit application by various neighborhoods. Yep, let me unmute you again. Let me see you. Stand by. There we go. Go ahead, Tom, if you can unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. You got to okay. unmute yourself. There okay. you go. Thank you. Just in terms, then it sounds like uh, the data collection will not necessarily uh, be for those already anticipated highly congested areas this summer, that uh, there's going to be some measure of time 
and then the application for a residential permit parking uh, process will get underway. So this is something, let's say it gets started in November, December after the season, everyone's filtered the data. What do you expect the timeline would be for a somewhat typical residential parking uh, situation? In my experience, um, it's been about a six month time frame in most cases. So my suggestion would be because of the fact that we know that there's needs to be some code updates, is that to continue to monitor the program and obviously keep abreast of, you know, the, because there if any code updates going to require, you know, public readings and, and so on and so forth. So paying attention to those details, especially as we navigate through this summer and the Board of Supervisors review of the program and of hopefully ultimate approval of the recommendations. And then I would suggest that based on um, that timeline that you described, you're probably on about the right scale of when you would apply for it. But again, being how this will be a new process, I don't wanna make any promises obviously on behalf because we don't truly know what it means, but I will just say in my experience, the processes typically take about six months, but again, it could be sooner, could be you know longer, but I do think that what we are doing is setting it up for the future. And my hope is, is that it won't be that cumbersome in the process, um, hopefully we efficient, but that's something that I think will come along with this process. And I would just suggest monitoring it as we get through um, this process or this era, basically. Thank you. Um, yeah, it sounds like uh, beach traffic, which is quite seasonal. If it doesn't get done this summer, the study wouldn't even be initiate till next summer. The, uh, I think as long as you saw that your streets, which I think that they probably are, given what you saw the study map, I would anticipate that we'll have your streets covered for that. And uh, that's something that as you see the technology being launched, it's absolutely a worthwhile question to ask, you know, like to be able to inquire and say, hey, are, you know, is my street one of the streets that's included, you know, in the process or in the monitoring? I'm I'm hopeful that if we get the technology implemented, that we're going to have the expanse beyond even the study area, so that that way we can demonstrate the effectiveness of the program and the spillover impacts. So any place we can do it before and after. But again, I want to be realistic with what that effect is as well. But I I just I would say pay close attention to the process. And don't be shy to raise your hand and ask the questions as we're going through it, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming today. We appreciate you, for sure. Do we have anybody else that wants to raise their hand? It's also worked out well when you turned your cameras on, if that helps as well, to be able to spot you if you wanted to ask a question. Let me just take a quick peek in the chat and see if anybody else has posted a chat in the chat box. Not seeing anything else there. We are right at an hour, but we do have plenty of time scheduled. But I also want to be respectful of everybody's time. I'm not seeing anyone else raising their hand. There is on the toolbar again, there is a reactions button where you can raise your hand. Or you can also um, put a comment in the chat. Or you can also turn your camera on and I'll spot you here if that'll help us uh, identify anyone else that has any comments, questions. So Rebecca, I think that we have uh, heard from hopefully everyone. In the meantime, I'm going to ask my colleague Jennifer just to reiterate the project email address in the chat so that anybody who maybe thinks about something after you leave here today and want to drop us a note. Um, in the meantime, uh, Rebecca, I'll hand the microphone back over to you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, yeah, just reiterating that if you didn't feel comfortable maybe asking the question, you'd certainly have the email option. Please reach out. Um, all input is is uh, appreciated, and um, we really appreciate your time again and, and hope to see you again soon at one of the future outreach community meetings. Thank you all. Thank you. Good day.